Where's AJ? We all set? Great. Well, welcome all of you to UNH School of Law. It's great to have you in the building. Um, and it's great to have this distinguished panel with us today for a really interesting conversation about um, the, the never, it's what seems to be a never ending stream of, of unbelievable mistakes and, and, and uh, regulatory, uh, uh, not just regulatory mistakes, but all sorts of you know, regulatory confusion and, and uh, missteps that seems to characterize professional sports these days. Um, as we were just talking about with Mike and BJ, uh, you know, the news is engaging on its, you know, sort of on its face, Deflate Gate and Ray Rice and Adrian Peterson, the list goes on and on. But embedded in all of those uh, controversies are really interesting, difficult questions of regulatory law um, and that pose questions for anyone interested in sports and entertainment law, which is, um, you know, the, the focus of the institute here at the law school that's sponsoring this panel, really difficult questions that need to be sorted through and it sort of highlights um, the really exciting area of, of law practice that, uh, that Mike and his colleagues at the Sports Entertainment Law Institute here at the, at the law school um, are heading up. So I'd like to just briefly um, call attention to the Sports Entertainment Law Institute. We launched it two years ago. Mike and his colleague Alex Roberts. Um, they have very quickly built it into a terrific and critical component of the curriculum here at the law school. Um, they've had a great year sending more and more students into legal residency placements with the help of Professor Courtney Brooks uh, sitting over there. The curriculum is expanding with the help of Mike and many of the people that he's brought to the law school, such as BJ. I understand one of our panelists, Dan Wallach, is, where's Dan? Dan, Dan is actually mentoring one of our students in Miami. Is it this upcoming? Now, now. Speaking now. Of, from a distance, like yeah. <laughs> so it's really it's really an amazing thing that's that that is being built by Mike and Alex, and I think it's fair to say that they will, in short order, um, have established here at UNH School of Law one of the most formidable programs in sports and entertainment law in American legal education. Um, and we are committed to supporting him in that effort. And the program tonight is one small piece of that larger effort to really make the study of sports and entertainment law um, a, a vibrant and critical component of our identity and our curriculum. Um, so enough of the law school and, and the institute. The program tonight, as I mentioned, raises you know, some of the most important legal issues in sports that we've seen over the last a uh, few years, Deflategate, Peterson, the list goes on and on. Um, the uh, question about the, le the for example, um, you know, the NBA's legal right to punish Donald Sterling for his racist comments. You know, it may strike most of us as a, as a pretty straightforward question. Um, he's out of bounds, the league should do something but the league's, the league's capacity to do that and the legal and regulatory questions that are teed up by the league's attempt to regulate Sterling's conduct and Sterling, and Sterling speech raise really tough, tough questions um, that hopefully the panel uh, this evening will get a chance to, to walk us through um, to some degree. But that's just one example. We have many others I'm sure that the panel is going to be talking about um, really interesting times in, in American sports law. The moderator of the panel tonight is BJ, BJ Schechter, who is executive editor of Sports Illustrated. He's responsible for Sports Illustrated's uh, investigative journalism effort, uh, which has been uh, in high gear, I guess, over the last few years. Mike's part of that as well. And um, BJ also, we're proud to say, is part of our faculty. BJ teaches with Mike in our summer program course uh, touching on sports and journalism and the intersection of um, those two disciplines. And we're honored to call him one of our own and I'd like to turn it over to BJ to, to launch the terrific program. So thanks again to, for all of you, to all of you for, for joining us and, and thanks to you for being here tonight. BJ. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dean Bodden. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. It's a uh, 
it's a pleasure and an honor to be back here uh, up at UNH. We had a great panel here last year, and uh, I, I very much enjoyed my association here with the uh, university. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted, to, uh, on a personal note, um, you know, to recognize two individuals. Um, just in the last couple weeks, um, one of our panelists, uh, Alan Milstein, lost his mother. Zelda Milstein, and uh, just w this week I lost my mother, um, Myrna Schechter. So if I could ask if we could have a brief 30-second moment of silence to uh, honor Zelda and Myrna, please. Thank you. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, our, our panel tonight is, uh, we, we have a lot to cover, and um, you know the way it's gonna go is we're gonna hit a, a number of topics, and uh, hopefully we'll have lively debate. Um, we're gonna take some questions at the end. Um, we have some time built in for that, but uh, if any of you have questions as we go, um, you know, as time allows, we, uh, you know, we certainly, um, can entertain those and we want this to be uh, as interactive as possible and I know this group will be very interactive and if not, uh, I will do my best to uh, make sure they are. Um, so, um, you know, this is really a, a transformative era in professional sports um, and uh, in the leagues and how they address personal misconduct players, uh, coaches and even owners as we've seen and we're gonna start with one of those uh, uh, cases here. Um, there have been several high profile cases over the last year as we've seen. Uh, some of them are still ongoing. Um, the Aaron Hernandez trial, at which Professor McCann is uh, actively writing about. Um, you know, some, um, some are criminal, some involve constitutional law, some are contract law, um, CBA issues, uh, and, and so forth. Um, all of these cases that we're going to talk about have significant ramifications, um, some of them financial, some of them in the courts, um, but they have, are going to have a tremendous impact uh, on the future of uh, not only professional sports, but college and amateur sports as well. Um, tonight we're going to look at how leagues investigate disciplining um, under their personal contact, uh, conduct policies. Um, we'll also talk about what leagues um, can and should learn about players while they're in college. Um, what is their responsibility? Um, we understand that uh, this contact attracts attention um, that is not limited to what happens on the field. Um, so we'll also look at uh, you know, what's happened off the field and surrounding the games, uh, the flake gate uh, being uh, a case that uh, hits home um, to a lot of people. Uh, here and, and and I do consider myself a Patriots fan, so I might have some uh, some strong feelings on that as well. Um, so tonight we'll have four segments. Um, we'll discuss uh, owner conduct issues, player conduct issues, uh, issues of fair play, um, Deflate Gate, uh, Bounty Gate, um, Spy Gate, even um, every gate that we can imagine. <laughs> And uh, lastly, we're going to have uh, a full segment for uh, for questions. But as I said, if um, we, uh, you know, if you have questions or um, are wondering about something, please don't be shy and raise your hands, and we'll we'll uh, we'll get you up here to the mic. Um, so let's uh, you know let, let's introduce our panel. We're we're very proud to uh, be joined by a very distinguished and accomplished uh, panel here tonight. Um, I'll start uh, by going in order here. Um, Mike McCann is, uh, you know, the executive director of the Sports Law uh, Institute here at the University of New Hampshire School of Law. He's also Sports, Illust Sports Illustrated's legal analyst. Uh, I remember, I think it was about eight years ago that I called uh, Mike when he was at the uh, Mississippi School of Law and asked him if he wanted to uh, analyze some some legal issues involving sports, and and it's probably the best hire that I've ever made. Um, because, uh, you know, Mike has been extraordinary and, uh, you know, has been very busy over the last several years uh, in addition to everything that, uh, you know, he's been doing here 
um, and uh, his research and educational efforts. Also, check him out on TV. He's been quite the become quite the TV star. <laughs> um, Next, I'm, uh, we're proud to be joined by Alan Milstein. Uh, Mr. Milstein is one of the leading, uh, nation's leading litigators in sports law and bioethics um, and the law. He's a shareholder at Sherman Silverstein in New Jersey. Um, he's litigated on behalf of Maurice Claret in his very historic challenge on the uh, N N NFL's eligibility rule. Um, he's also litigated on behalf of Eddie Curry when the Chicago Bulls attempted to uh, require that Curry take a DNA test. Um, he's uh, also been involved with cases involving Allen Iverson, Carmelo Anthony, Allen Houston, uh, and many others. Kimberly Myers is uh, director of criminal the criminal practice clinic here uh, at the law school. Um, she teaches uh, trial advocacy. She's an accomplished attorney with a focus on criminal defense. She's a 2001 graduate of UNH Law, and after graduating, clerked for Chief Justice John Broderick of the New Hampshire Supreme Court. Um, so we're very proud to be uh, joined by uh, Ms. Myers here tonight, and uh, we will be talking a lot uh, about how athletes and, and, and owners uh, intersect with the law. Um, Robert Rayola is um, the Sports and Entertainment Senior Group Manager at O'Connor Davies in New Jersey. He's a certified public accountant and is nationally a nationally recognized expert on sports, tax, and business matters. He represents a number of professional athletes in tax-related manners. Um, he's also co-author of Winning Tax Strategies and Planning for Athletes and Entertainers, and he's co-authored co several uh, pieces with uh, Mike McCann for SI.com. Um, Dan Wallach is a shareholder at Becker and Politikoff in Florida, um, in the Miami area. He's a national recognized expert on gaming law and sports law. He's represented uh, racetracks, casino operators, and poker rooms in gaming-related uh, matters. Um, he's also written extensively about New Jersey's efforts to legalize sports wagering in the face of opposition by uh, the professional sports leagues in the NCAA. So we're very proud to be joined by uh, Mr. Wallach. Uh, finally, um, Warren Zola is the Executive Director of the Office of Corporate and Government Affairs at Boston College's Carroll School of Management. Uh, Mr. Warren, uh, Mr. Zola teaches uh, graduate courses in the Carroll School and lectures around the country. Um, he's Chair of Boston College's Professional Sports Counseling Panel. Um, and also counsels student athletes on the transition from college to professional sports. Um, so we have a great uh, panel here with many of areas of expertise. So uh, let's dive right in. And our first area um, that we're going to talk about is owner misconduct. And we've seen several cases, um, you know, over the last year. Most prominently, uh, Donald Sterling, the former uh, owner of the Clippers. Um, last year, uh, Mr. Sterling, who was 80 years old, um, was permanently banned by the NBA. Um, it occurred four days after TMZ uh, published an audio recording of a private conversation between Sterling and his alleged mistress. Um, during this conversation, uh, Mr. Sterling made a number of racially insensitive remarks, and then after a four-day investigation, Adam Silver concluded that Sterling was in breach of the NBA Constitution, and that warranted a lifetime suspension. Um, the NBA moved to force to sell him, to forced him uh, to sell the team, which he eventually did. Um, and uh, this was tied up in the courts for a long time. Um, and uh, you know, I'm going to start with Mike, uh, who wrote extensively on this. And, and let's start by uh, you know addressing the issue: Was this justified? So uh, thank you, BJ, and thank you, everyone coming here tonight. Uh, we're really excited about tonight's panel, and, and I, know, uh, I know you're all busy, so we, we appreciate you making time for us. I do think the NBA was justified in issuing a lifetime suspension of Adam, uh, excuse me, of Donald Sterling, and I say that because of the NBA's constitution. The NBA's constitution set out about 10 different circumstances in which the league could decide to issue a suspension. Uh, of any length, really an indefinite length. And the NBA argued, and I think persuasively, that Sterling's comments caused substantial harm to the league. 
we know that sponsors drop or at least threaten to drop their affiliation with the Clippers. That has an impact on the revenue that was obtained by the Clippers in terms of TV rights. We know that the NBA players, led by, led by the best NBA player, LeBron James, threatened a boycott of playoff games. This is a pretty significant move. We also know that the President of the United States took time while he was on a trip to China to talk about this and to criticize Donald Sterling to say that this, uh, this tied into the legacy of slavery in the United States. These were some really serious moments caused by these remarks. And I think the NBA- You think the boycott, moment, you think the boycott threat was even real? arguably real? I do. I, I, think, I, think, think if, I think they would have. You think if, they, if, the, if San Diego was in the playoffs, they would win because the other teams would forfeit? You really think that? LeBron would not play in the championship game? But how could he, if he came out and said, I'm going to do it, and then he doesn't, right? If both teams don't play, there's no game. No, but San Diego's going to play. You mean San Diego? Well, you're dating LA. yourself now. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Sacramento. <laughs> Here he, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Well, the Clippers. Buffalo first. The LA Clippers. I think, uh, here's the thing. So if LeBron says it, and then he doesn't do it, I mean, it's going to look, it's going to really undermine his credibility. Well, I don't, well, <coughs> the players wouldn't be walking away from game checks during the playoffs. They would have already been paid their salaries for the year. I mean, There's correct me if I'm no wrong. There's no way they boycott those games. No way. I Why not? Be, what, what kind of statement would they make if they did? Even if it's one game. If, it's, if they boycott one game and they lose money, they get fired, whatever, that's a statement. I'm not saying they would miss the whole playoffs, but one game. As far as a money issue, the way – works in basketball and in most sports. Most sports, team sports, the players can only get paid during the season. A number of years ago with the NBA, players, ownership really decided that instead of paying you over the course of just the season, why don't we do you a favor and help you budget by stretching out many millions over a year as opposed to, you know, six months. And if you get suspended for one game, instead of saying, well, it's only one out of 82, I'll be generous and say, well, it's one out of 110. How they got to 110, I don't know. But I know the other night when James Harden got suspended, and I happened to use Twitter once in a while, I put it out there. It's a, you know, some ridiculous you know, amount of money about what you know, McCann makes to teach one of these classes, $235,000 <laughs> yeah. or, or whatever it was. But you know, the regular season is for money, was... and the postseason is for rings. The money in the postseason is, is a couple hundred thousand if you win per player. So they would have not lost money. We'll have to have another case like this so that these guys can debate whether they would have really lived up to the – Bluff or not? But. Well, I, I mean, I think what was going on is that it was a deal made before uh, before the, the NBA supposedly was. Established. I think uh, LeBron spoke to people at the NBA, and and it was a sort of a conspiracy of, hey, you know what? We'll we'll say we're not going to play against this team. That'll give you pretty good reason to throw this bum out maybe so all right let's let's get back to sterling and, and i want to bring in i want to bring in um kimberly here and let's talk about free speech you know was this free speech and you know let's uh, would this have held up in court um because of the way this came out you know tmz obtained it the way they did um but let's talk about free speech and this evidence this smoking gun would have been would have it been admissible well, a couple of things. First, I'm not, uh, I, I definitely don't um, intend to uh, hold myself out as any expert on the cons on constitutional matter. So, um, but in terms of, you know, in terms of evidence, like if, if you know, how would, how would this play out in that regard? Um, you know, there's this terrible little um, hearsay exception in the um, state rules of evidence, and I believe it exists in the federal rules as well, where um, an individual's um, incriminating statements are allowed in against them and they're not considered to be hearsay. Um, but that, d that begs the question of, you know, in the manner in which the, statement, the statements are obtained and whether that would affect their admissibility. And, um, I mean, I think that there's certainly a question over, um, 
you know, uh, in that regard, um, assuming that that hurdle is, um, you know, if that, that hurdle's gotten over, then I think the rules of evidence would allow something like that to come in, absolutely. Um, but, you know, I think there's certainly a huge question out there of whether, um, whether that, the initial hurdle would be overcome um, because of the manner in which they were obtained. Alan, you, you, you've challenged the leagues enough times. Was this free speech and was this justified? It wasn't justified. It was the, it was the height of hypocrisy. They knew this guy was a racist for 10 years. He did nothing. I mean, there were pleadings. There, there, there were pleadings filed in court detailing how this guy had abused his African-American players and assistant coaches. They knew he was a racist. Now, because TMZ releases a tape, suddenly there is this moment of outrage and he's going to be kicked out the next day. Uh, I, I just really didn't, I mean, and I'm no apologist for Donald Sterling, but I just thought it was the height of hypocrisy to feign outrage about something you knew was in place for years. Yeah, BJ, I think the NBA had a real problem on its hands with admissibility of this type of evidence. Uh, the recording was done surreptitiously by a paramour for lack of a better word, whatever you want to call uh, her, and I don't even remember her name. She's a mere foot. Viviano. Yeah, she's a mere footnote in NBA history. But California, California and New York have electronic eavesdropping statutes, and evidence obtained um, secretly, you know, by recording the person uh, in private without their consent is inadmissible. It's inadmissible in a court proceeding. It's inadmissible in an administrative proceeding. Which would, which would be what the NBA's disciplinary proceedings to take away his franchise would be. So how could the NBA justify a forced sale of a $2 billion asset based on nothing other than inadmissible evidence? It seemed to be a stretch. And luckily for the NBA, they weren't called to account for that and didn't have to justify it in a court of law because their dirty work was done by Shelley Sterling. Donald Sterling's wife betrayed Donald and had him declared incompetent and had the franchise essentially taken out from under him for a uh, bargain price of $2 billion, which could not be challenged on appeal. So we never reached the threshold question of whether the NBA would be able to get away with this kind of a suspension and a forced sale of the Clippers based on nothing but inadmissible evidence. And I'm kind of disappointed. While Donald Sterling doesn't deserve our sympathy, uh, I do believe in the concept of equal justice under the law. And if, if if it would be a violation of his uh, statutory and constitutional rights under California law but to use that evidence against him, well, how can the NBA justify taking his franchise away he, from him? He gave up a lot of those rights when he became an owner of the league, period. Private association, they can dictate the terms as long as they're following their own CBA and bylaws and constitution. And if they say they can, they can throw them out, it's irrelevant whether they obtain this evidence legally. We're not in a criminal court system here, right? We're talking about did he have a negative impact on their business? And I forget, Mike, you probably will remember section seven, paragraph two, sub item seven, that says, if you have a negative impact on your business, yeah. we, have, we have the right to dismiss you, and they did. And by the way, it all became moot four days later or five days later, we decided to go on Anderson Cooper and repeat himself publicly right. on CNN. Right. So at that point, doesn't matter. And the NBA didn't use the original recording. It used the TMZ broadcast of it. And, and at what point, by the way, I, I hate to bring Ray Rice into this because I know that's section two. At what point did TMZ too, become so. our moral arbiter here <laughs> with right. Rice and Sterling? I, I just, I, it's a sad society we live in that we have got to rely upon TMZ for yeah. breaking news. Well, well, I, I well also let me just tell you about that. <laughs> Please As do a it. journalist, it makes my stomach crawl, but I, if you can back up a truck and pay people, you can get whatever you want. Well, I, well, I'm sure BJ can add to this, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was no Twitter, there was no you know, advent of social news spreading like wildfire, and whenever the, one of these incidents happened, there was now more immediate pressure and I'm not a lawyer, and I'll leave that to all the lawyers and would-be lawyers in the room, but um, to, to, to take action against these type of things. I mean, when Sterling and Michael and I talked about this at length, and he, Michael wrote about it a lot, when Sterling was forced to sell the team, nobody knew what the team was worth. You know, there used to be a magazine called Forbes way back in the day. It was a really prestigious magazine, and now a lot of different people write for them. 
and they come up with all values of teams. I'm not sure where they come from. I'm not sure they're always accurate, but nobody was at $2 billion, that's for sure. So, you know, he, he goes to sell the team that he had paid some ridiculously low value for. So I explained to Michael, this is a forced sale, but he's got a huge capital gain. That, you know, again, no pity for the gentleman. I think he's, well, I can't really say what I think he is, but um, mm -hmm. what, what happened was he had a forced sale and a huge capital gain. If he would have passed away and his heirs would have inherited what he had, we get in tax law a step up in basis. He would have saved millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars if he was able to do that. And then, you know, so Michael eloquently wrote all the rules and put this out there. And, you know, I think what, you know, what BJ alluded to at the beginning with the pressure of social media, as soon as something happens, it goes like wildfire. I think you know, we could do two hours on Sterling. I mean, yeah. it's such a great story. Well, yeah, but I want to bring I want to bring back something that that Alan brought up is this is not a surprise. You know, this guy was a racist. He was a jerk for a long time. They tried to kick him out of the league when uh, you know back when he owned the San Diego Clippers. So, shouldn't the league and the owners bear some responsibility? And he's not the only racist right. owner in professional sports. Mm -hmm. Especially. And I think that's a great point because they, there was a lot of written, and in BJ, you know this, a lot was written about that some of these other owners were really scared because of private conversations that they had, maybe racist in nature, with him or jokes or whatever it may be. They were afraid that it's all going to come out, and then their wife or paramours or whatever would find out that they're racist or whatever. I mean, one, but, one only needs to look at the record of professional coaches who were African American in the NFL and, and certainly Major League Baseball. And it's a terrible record. And why not why not attack the colleges in the uh, National Collegiate Athletic Association and their record of hiring African American coaches? So you know, at this top level, uh, Donald Sterling was certainly not the only racist in the group. I, I want to ask you, Kimberly. You know, let's talk about precedent for a second. Is or is, is the NBA setting a dangerous precedent? for you know, having these standards for the next time uh, a tape is released from an owner or an executive even in the league. I understand this is a private association. They have their own rules of conduct, but doesn't precedent still apply? I mean, from my perspective, it does. And I, you know, this is a little bit, um, you know, I, I had to actually do a lot of <coughs> Google searches for a lot of these names to catch myself up to speed on some of the way uh, manners in which the league handled the, uh, um, various misconduct that we're going to be talking about tonight. But you know, one thing that continues to strike me, and, and as we're talking, what the, what keeps repeating in my mind is this sort of theme of the court of public opinion. And you know, I think that that's I think it's dangerous. And you know, from my perspective, and I, I sort of ambushed Mike in the hallway once talking. I was all fired up about the Ray Rice situation. And you know, I think that that's why you're here tonight. Exactly <laughs> right. That's what I figured. I'll know better than to talk to you next time. Um, but anyway, you know, sort of what strikes me about it is that, you know, I spend my time in a criminal courtroom and there's, you know, there's a, a process and I spend 99% of my efforts and my time defending people's due process rights in a, in a criminal court. And, you know, what struck me about the way the Ray Rice situation was handled was this entire lack of due process. This, there was a, you know, a, a um, um, you know, divulging information that was um, enough information to make a decision about how should proceed and then all of a sudden you know this TMZ video is released and there's this public outcry and you know the court of public opinion kicks in and then all of a sudden there's this you know additional um, you know additional punishment that's levied on him so you know to me I think it does set this send very uh, set dangerous precedent for that reason um, I don't know where you know I don't know where the line sort of stops with things like this right I, I want to bring in um, you know Bruce Levinson the uh, the owner of the, the Hawks I mean Alan mentioned that um, that Donald Sterling was far from the only racist owner in sports. We saw it with, uh, with Bruce Levinson and the owner of the Hawks. He was forced to sell a team after emails surfaced in which uh, he suggested that too many African Americans were attending Hawks games and that was uh, impacting attendance uh, you know, by, by, by causation fans. Um, I'll turn to you, uh, Warren. It, was his punishment fair? Well, I mean, there's there's a stark difference between the Hawks and the Clippers sale, and I think that that, for me, as someone who pays attention, was a more compelling argument for Sterling's case under the antitrust laws because we've got the Sherman Act in Section 2 and restraint of trade, and 
for Sterling to be able to say that you're forcing me to sell my team, albeit for a preposterous <laughs> price, you're, you're restricting how much I might earn in the free market. And that to me was a compelling potential claim for, for him to say, you, you, this, this sale, while you can kick me out of the league, I still have a legal right to sell this team for as much as, as possible. The Hawks owner was given that right. He wasn't removed from the scenario and said, we're going to sell the team and we're going to do it you know, real quick and, and away we go. Um, so I think that was sort of an interesting component to the, the, the Clippers sale. And, and I, I understand what Robert's saying in terms of you go for, for $2 million, you've got these tax implications and maybe it's not as much. But I thought that that would have been an interesting thing to, to play itself out over time in the court system. And, and I think the thing that, I don't know where it stands legally, but it was also fascinating about this whole case was you've got a commissioner who was really a rookie. I mean, he was, he was the, you know, uh, uh, the sidekick for a long time, the deputy commissioner, but all of a sudden, we don't know what he's going to do, and we don't know if he can speak in public. We don't know if he's practiced like Mike McCann speak on TV, that little room that Mike has in his house that we all see once in a while. But, um, you know, he all of a sudden was thrust into the fire. And his commissionership will forever be remembered, hopefully not the only thing he does right, but about what happened at the beginning of his situation. You know, Alan, you've been in courtrooms all the time. Who knew what he was going to say or not? And he went into that room, and I'm sure he was nervous. And all of a sudden, he's a hero now. You know, Goodell is Goodell. You know, but, I mean, in terms of all the other stuff that's going on, Manfred's a new guy, Bettman, nobody cares about hockey. But um, you know, all, all of a sudden, you know, he, he's there, and he's in the, the cover of all these magazines and everything, and he's thrust into the fire, and, and people will think he did a great job. But he had the own. I mean, the, he had spoken with the owners. He had lined it all up. He'd, he'd been engaged. The owners used him in the sense of, here's exactly what we want to have happen. You go make it happen. But he knew before he took that podium, he took that mic and was interviewed, that he had their backing. Right. It, this wasn't sort of a random gut reaction. I'm going to go out and say, here's our punishment. I, I hope that the owners back me. It was the exact opposite. The owner said, here's what we're going to do. They had it lined up. You've got this whole new breed of owners who are happy to be rid of Sterling, and that's part of why it probably didn't happen you know, when he opened his mouth 20 years ago and made mistakes uh, or racist comments. Uh, and now they're more brand conscious. But don't forget the old breed of owners were scared, really scared. And, and the new Alan, breed? You know, was really scared because he f they felt they may be brought out that they had these racist conversations, jokes, God forbid, emails or whatever it may be. So I'm sure that was not an easy thing and he pulled it off. Yeah, but there's a world of difference between suspending uh, an owner for life based upon, you know, th th this kind of speech and then taking away his property mm -hmm. rights through a forced sale. Yeah. There's a world of difference. And while the NBA is a private association, I can guarantee you that the NBA's chances in court uh, were not necessarily a done deal. Private associations don't have the complete unfettered right to do whatever they want. They still are subject to judicial review, subject to certain exceptions, and, and one of those exceptions is that they have to be consistent in their past behavior, and that's called the arbitrary and capricious standard. And I'd like to know what the NBA did when James Dolan, uh, the owner of the Knicks, tolerated an atmosphere of sexual harassment uh, with his chief marketing employee that resulted in a jury verdict of, of $11.6 million. And Larry Bird once said of Isaiah, uh, uh, Isaiah Thomas, once said of Larry Bird, if he were black, he would just be another player. Uh, so I believe the NBA's chances in court hinging upon TMZ uh, recording uh, would not necessarily have held up. And luckily, you know, Shelley Sterling came along to save the day for the NBA because uh, this trial or th this litigation would have gone on for several years, uh, plus an appeal. This was the fastest I've ever seen somebody stripped of a $2 billion asset. It went from late April to early August. No trial, no appeal, no, uh, no determination of competency in a court of law. It was, it was simply whether uh, Shelley Sterling followed the correct procedures in having uh, her husband declared incompetent. It was the quickest I've ever seen somebody's property rights stripped away from them without having any day in court or any right to appeal. And it's troubling. While Donald Sterling is, is nobody's idea of a good person, uh, the law should apply, and I've, I've, I've hearkened back to this, should apply equally to everybody. And when it happens to somebody uh, who's a good person, uh, we're, we're going to complain and we're going to protest. And uh, I think Donald got a raw deal through the way he was treated by the peculiarities of the California probate code, 
the way his wife betrayed him, and the way the NBA operated in secrecy while the probate court trial was going on. They had all the votes lined up to approve uh, the new owner uh, before the ink was dry on the court order, so that the moment the court order was signed in the probate court approving the transfer of the sale from Shelley Sterling to uh, uh, Steve Ballmer, within a second, that deal was done, and there was no right to an appeal uh, under California law. So Donald's, you know, Donald's ship had already sailed. And I think that's troubling on one level, and because he's a very unpopular man and committed a, a loathsome act in the eyes of many, nobody complains. But if that owner had been Peter Holt, the owner of the San Antonio Spurs, would we be viewing this in a different light as you know, somebody who just had a bad day? Let's, uh, before we move on from this topic, let's, uh, we talked about the court of public opinion. We've talked about Twitter, we've talked about other forms of social media. Um, and if we look at Bruce Levinson and, and Donald Sterling, two different cases, but we have a recording, we have an email. We're gonna talk a lot about uh, this and in, in the Ray Rice case and, and other domestic violence cases because we had a tape. Uh, what role did that play? You know, the fact that we heard Donald Sterling, we knew he was a racist, but we heard it. With, uh, you know, with, with Levinson, we have some emails. That's, that, that's not as chilling. It's not as impactful. Um, th what role did that play? I think it's a huge, huge, huge public, uh, you know, Kimberly mentioned huge public pressure, uh, you know, and the rush to judgment immediately and to make a decision. You know, with social media, it's all out there. And, 10 years, 15 years ago, this wasn't there. So maybe things got out or not. But, you know, look, we all know that in Ray Rice did a despicable act, but if there wasn't a video, well, what did he do? Once the video came up, people's opinion really changed. And I think with the pressure of public opinion, I mean, look, Dan mentioned the, the value of the team and all that, and what happened to, to, to um, the, the Clippers owner, but all of a sudden, an asset that uh, was valued at 600 million by Forbes in April sold for $2 billion in September. Now, did that have to do with new TV money? Or well, who knows what it had to do, but nobody, but nobody thought, you know, except, except for uh, Bill from ESP and Bill Simmons, thought an asset could be worth that much. But well, there's a terrible huge evaluation. pressure from social media to, mm. to, to act quickly on this stuff. Well, you see, you're seeing here that the leagues are responding to, you know, the videos and the tape recordings are forcing the league's hand to take action. Consider what would have happened had uh, Donald Sterling's girlfriend made a public accusation that Donald said these things. No one would have cared. Uh, but the existence of a videotape, the existence of an audio tape, just changed the entire dynamic. And the league is forced to take action because of public pressure, media, media pressure, and uh, influence and coercion by sponsors. So I question whether the, uh, w w the concept of, of due process and whether there's actual justice here or are the leagues viewing due, you know, due process as, as strictly a monetary issue and what's, whatever, whatever's most expedient for the business of the league. And, and the existence of these tapes, that, it's a game changer. I mean, Ray Rice was, was, was disciplined for only two games based upon the admission of, of conduct that the videotape just simply confirmed. Uh, there was no new act in the elevator videotape. Uh, there was no new act uh, that Donald Sterling had committed in, the, in, in, in that audio tape. It just simply put a public face and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a horrible image for public consumption. And that's why the league was forced to take action and took, in my view, in both cases, what could have been excessive action. And uh, uh, you know, the world that we live in now with audio, audio tapes, videotapes, it became a complete game changer. Just consider what would have happened had those tapes not existed and they had just been public accusations. I, f I totally agree with you, and I think part of, Thanks. I mean, in a, you're welcome. There's one more. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I definitely agree. I think, you know, as a, as a trial attorney, would I rather have a witness take the stand and describe an act, or would I rather have a picture waved around to a jury? I mean, you know, a, a recording versus somebody um, accusing, or a video versus somebody describing. Um, a picture versus somebody describing, I mean, they're, they're very different um, levels of persuasion involved in those. And so, I, you know, my understanding of what happened in the Ray Rice situation was that he had disclosed what happened. So there are, you know, words describing the act 
and that was what led to the um, mm -hmm. uh, to the two-game suspension. And then the video comes out that that's you know you can actually see the act take place, and there's this whole other element to it because you know the reality is is that you know the image of it, the the actual you know watching it happen is very different in terms of its persuasive value than 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 words are. And so I think that's part of what. You know, that's part of, like, you know, you were saying if you had heard somebody accuse Sterling of saying those words as opposed to hearing the actual words come out of his mouth, there's just a totally different um, reaction, a gut reaction that people have to that type of, um, to that um, delivery of that kind of information. So I think, uh, you know, I, I think that that certainly feeds into a potential overreaction, you know, by... Um, you know, I don't want to say the public necessarily overreacted, but you know, to a league overreaction based on a very strong public reaction to that type of persuasive but, um, information. He would have been better off uh, having that conversation in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you know, so that. <laughs> right. But, but that in the Rice case, there's there's a, there's a distinct difference here in the Rice case. I mean, let's not confuse. You know, I understand that if you've got something on video versus something that's said in in, in a dark room with nothing, there's a, there's a big difference in, in everything else. But the evidence was there. I mean, we had a video that was there. And just because the NFL decided initially to potentially underpunish based on what actually happened, and then TMZ shows this and the whole universe responds, and now they potentially overpunish, the evidence was there. And if Goodell and the NFL, the very first time, and I, you know, whether you want to believe they saw the video or not, if they had at least listened to what was said and knew there was video and they saw the video, and the very first time they had come out with a reasonable response that was based on previous um, punishments, based on collective bargaining and everything else, that would have been somewhere in the middle, then we wouldn't have this public outcry of them over-responding when TMZ video flashed. I mean, the, the evidence was there the first time for Goodell. Well, I, I'm, I wanna, we're going to talk a lot about Ray Rice in a second. And, um, Let me say one more thing about Sterling. Sure. I mean, if, if you believe in Roswell and the grassy <laughs> knoll, doesn't this whole story sound a bit contrived? I mean, as, as Dan says, I mean, this, everything happened within such a short period of time. You have LeBron James, who prior to this never took a political stand about anything. You had TMZ come up with this tape, and then you had Donald Sterling, clever like a fox, ending up, and his wife, ending up with $2 billion in his pocket, and the NBA having this Steve Ballmer. Pre-tax. Steve Ballmer as its <laughs> owner. So the whole story, to me, is, it is a bit contrived. I'm just tossing that out there for the conspiracy theorists that. among you. Lots of them. But uh, before we move on to what is going to be the hottest topic of the night, I'm sure, I want to bring it back to you, Mike, because um, Sterling Levinson, uh, you know, we talked about Jim Dolan and, and Adam Silver pretty much praising him for, you know, writing a very offensive email and being loyal. Um, we saw, you know, what happened with uh, Colts owner Jim Ursay, who had a DUI. Um, you know, Fred Wilpon, his ties to Bernie Madoff, uh, you know, Frank McCord in his ugly divorce case. This stuff is prop propping up all over professional sports, and it seems like many of the leagues are making it up as they go. Is anybody getting it right? Well, I, I think the leagues are responding in a way that reflects how much damage the controversy causes the league. I actually think it's more about harm inflicted upon the league's reputation than it is the underlying act. To me, that's one way of trying to explain why Donald Sterling's racism prior was, was permitted. I, I don't think it was as public. I mean, I had heard things about Donald Sterling that people would whisper, but there was never a recording of it. I don't know Bruce Levinson, but that e the emails that he sent, I think, gave us real evidence. And, and to me, I think a lot of how the leagues respond, this doesn't necessarily sort of morally justify what they're doing, but it rationally explains what they're doing that their, their decision making is based on how big of a controversy it is as opposed to how bad the underlying act was. And I think that is true with Jim Ursay, where there's a photo, there's a mugshot of him, but it hasn't really resonated to the same extent. The, the Jamie and Frank McCourt's divorce, while controversial, 
didn't trigger the same type of outcry. I think what got Major League Baseball interested in the Frank McCourt, Jamie McCourt divorce was when he stopped being able to make payroll and when he wanted to do a local TV deal with Fox that the Major League Baseball didn't want to do, suddenly he was going against the league interest. And I think then baseball and Bud Selig intervened and took over the team in a custodial relationship. So to me, it's really about impact on league reputation that's motivating all of their decision making in the manner in which they punish. Well, given, and this is the last point on this topic, and I'll open it to anybody on the panel, given we're sitting here in a law school and we're we're debating uh, the legality of this. Is that legal? You know, impact on the reputation of the, the league and making it up as you go. Is that legal? Is that the legal way to do it? I, well, I'll let you go. Those are two or, questions. I mean, legal and way to do it. Those are two separate. Okay, questions. Okay, is it legal? Right. Let's let's go with. Well, let's, it's legal. It's, let's, let's it's, it's legal, it's legal because it. because franchise there, there's agreement. A, there's a very right. broad statement in yeah. player contracts yeah. and in owner contracts yeah. that says. Essentially, you do anything that is detrimental to the league, then we can do whatever we want to do to you. Whatever we can do, the new yeah. phrase is football, protecting the shield. Right? How many times did you hear about protecting the shield? Or they came out with this new term, commissioner exempt list. What does that mean? I never heard of it. Michael would know better than I never heard of it. It means you can sit on the side, so it looks like we did something. Well, but oh, by the way, you know, Greg Hardy is still going to make $12 million a year. It hadn't been used. It was only referenced in the CBA okay. without being explained, and it took a non-collectively bargained agreement to describe what it is. That mm -hmm. isn't even publicly available. Okay. But, yep. but, but I, I disagree with Michael on one point. With respect to the NFL, I mean, this is the gang that can't shoot straight. They do everything wrong. The public doesn't care. They love football. They yeah. love football. So it doesn't matter how screwed up the owners are and screwed up the commissioner is. If the Super Bowl is in and as long as people are hitting each other and giving each other concussions, everybody's going to watch. But I think that supports the fact that Ursay yeah. and Haslam haven't been punished with any severity, right? They've been – we've forgotten about it already. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm That's from Baltimore, and well, I it's a have you have a different situation. Right, the Colts. <laughs> yeah. Right, Mr. you haven't forgotten. Ursay's father, I guess it was, is not somebody that I That's forgot. Right. I mean, well, Warren, I'll, I'll give you the the last word on this topic, and, and to the second part of the question that you astutely pointed out: Is it the right thing to do? The right way to go about it? Private association. They're making their own rules for their own club, and so, you know, I mean, the NCAA is private actor. And, you know, they don't have to, you know, Jerry Tarkanian found out the due process doesn't come in there. So, you know, we might, we might disagree with it. We might be upset that someone's getting jettisoned for reasons that we wouldn't think is, are fair. But this is, you know, 30 men sitting in a room making decisions about how they want to run an industry or an organization. If you don't want to participate, don't buy a team. Go somewhere else. Yeah. Right. You uh, one more comment. Right. Bonus, bonus more uh, word. directors. Bonus cut. round. We'll do a directors cut on the issue. <laughs> I yield thirty seconds, uh, to my friend Dan. <laughs> um, <laughs> Start the clock. Uh, thirty seconds. You know, reputational harm is one thing, but you know, we're, we're, you're law school law school students. Reputational harm goes to the issue of damage. You still need a breach. You still need underlying conduct that's actionable and would justify jettisoning, jettisoning, jettisoning the owner. And in Donald Sterling's case, you have the reputational harm, but it was always um, a kind of vague to me what contract he exactly breached to justify the potential forced sale. And you know, private associations do have a lot of flexibility in their disciplining of, of their members and in their decision making, but it's not absolute. And the courts will not stand by for gross miscarriages of justice. And I, I believe as we're going forward with future cases, there's not going to be you know, one rule that's applicable. Every situation is going to be evaluated differently. And what struck me about the Sterling case uh, was the, the NBA conflated harm with the breach. And I never found, uh, I, I was never persuaded that there was a sufficient breach of a specific provision of the NBA constitution that would have justified uh, requiring Donald Sterling to sell his team. S the suspension of Sterling, that's a separate issue, but we never reached that threshold question, and I'm not sure the NBA made a compelling enough case under its constitution. Okay, let's move on to, uh, to Ray Rice and you know, some domestic violence uh, issues that the league has had. 
We all know what happened in the Ray Rice case. We've all seen the video. We are all appalled by it. Um, it we all know that, you know, that he, after, uh, you know, after the second video came out, uh, the NFL changed uh, the suspension. The Ravens cut Rice. Um, Rice ultimately appealed um, and, uh, and won an arbitration. Um, but I'm going to start with you, Kimberly, since you have such strong feelings, as we all do on this. But from the criminal aspect, why in the world was he able to plead out and essentially get no punishment despite this video? I, you know, I've, it's a really interesting question. And one of the things that I was sort of looking at during my Google research for, um, in preparation for tonight was, um, you know, what, what happened in a criminal court with some of these people. And I think... I know from, I, I've only ever defended people, I've never prosecuted, and as a defense attorney, I am often um, in a position where I'm arguing sentencing to a judge and I'm trying to point out what are the other um, punishments that this person has already experienced as a result of their conduct? Um, what have they lost in their lives because of what they've done? Um, and I offer that often to the court in an attempt to mitigate the punishment that's gonna be coming from the court. So. Um, you know, what, what struck me in some of these cases was the, the sort of leniency that seemed to be um, uh, levied by the courts. And I, and, I, and I don't know whether this is correct or not. My assumption was that that may have, in part, um, been due to a couple of factors, one of which I think is probably the fact that these people are losing a significant amount um, through, through the um, league punishment. So, you know, I've, I have represented um, indigent folks for my whole practice and career, save for just short of two years. So I have not represented people who have incomes of, you know, millions of dollars. I, um, but, you know, for, for the types of fines that have been levied on people or the suspensions, you know, that's, that's significant. And so I would imagine that that's something that plays into um, what a court is going to do, knowing that this other sort of um, punishment has taken place in another forum. The other thing that I suspect, and again, I don't know if this is um, if this is true, but my suspicion is, um, with someone like Ray Rice, I mean, domestic violence is something that is on uh, you know everybody's radar nationwide as um, a problem, a significant problem um, that our country uh, is is facing, and that the court system sees on a daily basis. And I think there's this sort of um, you know, when it, when something happens um, to a person of Ray Rice's caliber, and all of a sudden it's all over the media, you know, it comes flashing back to our attention in this in this very um, real and sort of visceral way. And you know, one of the um, one of the things that the um, court system stresses is really trying to um, to get people into programming and to get people into counseling to so that they can go back out and be in healthy relationships. And so part of you know his sentence was going through a domestic violence program, doing some community service, paying a fine in addition to the consequences he suffered with the league. And so you know I wonder if also that's you know the sort of the courts using a, this high profile person as an example of like you know we need to get people help. We need to get them into these counseling programs because that's what's going to alleviate the problem more so than, you know, throwing somebody in jail. Alan, you're licensed in, in New Jersey, and you've represented many athletes. Do you think Ray Rice was given preferential treatment by the courts? And, and I was interested to hear what the counselor had to say. I mean, do you really believe, <laughs> do you really believe that if a, an average person? No. With... <laughs> <laughs> With no reputation and that no prominence, no history of domestic violence, happens to get into a fight with his girlfriend or fiance and punches her. For the first time. For the first time. And knocks and, her out cold. And, and knocks, her, knocks out her out cold. Out, drags but, her then. But she refuses to press charges. She ends up marrying him. Do you really believe that the court would, in, would act any way different? I mean, I don't, I don't think the court would sentence that person to yeah. jail. I think the same exact thing would happen. The person would, if if the prosecutors decided to prosecute, and and normally when the when the victim doesn't want to prosecute, they don't decide to prosecute. What about the fact that there's a video? Right? Isn't that different from? It's it's you know, different. Right. It's different. There's actually, even it's without the witness, right. you can refer to the video. A That's video right. of a player who think, was instrumental in the team winning the Super Bowl. I think the judge would have done the exact same thing. I do not believe he got preferential treatment. I think the judge would have done the exact same thing. Told the told this couple that he has to go to uh, you know, some training for domestic violence, and that would have been the end of it. I think, I think if anything, Ray Rice uh, got treated 
differently than, you know, if a professor at this school was involved in that incident, and again, his wife doesn't press charges, the judge does exactly what, what this judge did, do you think that the University of New Hampshire would terminate his, yeah. his tenure here? Yeah. You think? Where's the dean? The dean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. dean, I, dean, would you, dean, would you, would you terminate the professor if, if this was a one-time event and uh, the, the, the victim didn't want to press charges and the, and the court did what, what it did in the Ray Rice situation? So would you would you terminate the professor? Would you Which terminate says what? the professor? <laughs> yeah. the, uh, there's an appeal, there is a uh, conduct policy that you know, I don't know whether that would be captured or not because I have it in front of me, but uh, after you know one goes through the charges are brought or if the university is of the opinion that a faculty member has violated the conduct policy in a sufficiently yeah. egregious way to institute termination procedures or proceedings then they go through, they go through their process. There is uh, a uh, contested proceeding. There are rights of arbitration. It's pursuant to, you know, written. But if you're the, rules. but if, if you, if you have the power of the commissioner, instead of having to do that, would you terminate that professor? Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to take the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> I, just to, just to respond to something briefly, that I, 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 I do think you got preferential treatment, and so I want to change my, my um, interruption of you when you first started talking. What I thought you were going to say was, do you really think that if some average person had done that, they would have gotten the same sentence he got? And my answer was going to be no, because I do think he got treated preferentially. I think in you the, think they would have put the guy in jail? Yes. I think in, this, in the state of New Hampshire, well, it, I mean, the, the problem is there's, there's so many, uh, you know, eight gazillion factors that go into, that go into a... Um, um, uh, you know, resolving a case um, by by way of plea and um, short of trial, and so I think you know, not knowing all of those um, many factors that go into that kind of decision. I mean, in New Hampshire, he would have been charged with. First of all, it wouldn't have been just one charge. There were probably several charges that would have come out of that. They would have been felonies. Um, you know, even if he was coming into a court with no prior record. Um, and if the victim was not on board with uh, prosecution, you know, it's on video. Um, any statement, prior statements that she had made to the police, I guarantee you prosecutors here would fight tooth and nail to find some way to, you know, they, they would um, issue a material witness warrant for her, they'd get her in court, they'd, you know, try to try their case based on the video um, and uh, any admissions that he may have made. And, you know, I don't think that he would have gotten away with probation community service um, a, f a minimal fine for his income and, um, you know, doing a 26-week program. Um, I, I just don't think it would have happened. BJ, I completely agree with uh, Kimberly, and uh, there's no question in my mind that Ray Rice received preferential treatment in this case for one reason and one reason only. He was uh, sentenced to participate in a pretrial diversion program which expressly excludes violent acts. If you commit a violent act and certainly cold cocking your uh, significant other in an elevator, knocking her out, dragging her by the hair across the casino floor would seem to rise to the level of the violent act that, would, that should ordinarily ex have excluded him from participation in this pretrial diversion program. And then as a practical matter, it certainly did not hurt that the elected prosecutor in Atlantic County or, or, or the county uh, graduated from Rutgers Law School. Ray Rice played college football at Rutgers University, and I hope, I hope this uh, event isn't being recorded. But it, it strikes me. It is. It, it, it strikes. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, it, it, it strikes. People in Rutgers can also see it. Yeah, it strikes me as as awfully convenient that a Rutgers prosecutor accepted a Rutgers football hero into a program for which he was not qualified on its face. But, I mean, bottom line. But, but I, I don't know about all that. But wait a second here. I, I'm not going to debate the criminal component to whether or not he received fair or um, fair treatment or not, or whether he, he, he got away with something. But if you think about what he received as punishment, his annual salary for this past season was what? Seven, ten, Robert? Uh, I'd have to. Eight and a half million. Right. Let's call it eight and a half million. Mm -hmm. Gone. Right. Number two. 
got some of them. You're a running back. Your career in the NFL, five to seven years if you're really lucky. That okay? would be more than that. That's your window. His career might be done. And for the rest of his life, he's got a stigma. He'll never make that money ever again. And his career is over. Nobody wants so, him now. So yeah. I think that if you want to talk about punishment, I think he got way more than the average person. I'll answer the professor question. Tenure, you don't get fired. No tenure, you do. Just my guess. And I'm not talking <laughs> about UNH. I'm talking about academia. So well, you, and I, at your school, you think, for an outside one-time event? You for non-tenured? Yes. For tenured? They get fired. I'm not going to talk about it. I do not represent Boston College. <laughs> Here's a I do not have tenure. <laughs> I love my university. <laughs> Just with values that embraces. Hi, Father. What about a Rutgers? I, I, don't, I, don't oh, yeah. no. <laughs> I don't disagree with you on that. And then that's kind of what I was saying at the outset, was that I think that probably the court had to have taken into consideration those additional right. punishments, which are, which are not something that the average person would suffer. Um, but, but, you know, I do think in terms of, um, Dan makes a good point about diversion, that, uh, you know, often their um, diversion programs are very specific to um, the types of offenses that, um, that they'll exclude from their program, and violent offenses are often um, one, of the, one of the types that will be excluded unless there's an agreement um, from the prosecutor to make an exception for a particular case that they say, well, Normally we don't, you know, we don't accept um, violent offenses, but we're going to do it in this case for whatever reason, which is, I think, where um, perhaps the preferential treatment um, for somebody like him would come in, because there m there might be more of a likelihood that a prosecutor is going to say, well, you know, we'll do it in this case, even though if this was some guy off the street that did this, you know, we wouldn't be so inclined to do it. I'm not going to debate the, you know, legal aspects of, of you know, pre-diversion or whatever that was or all that stuff. But back to what Warren said. Did anybody have a guess how much money players lost in 2003 fines and suspension in the not for, in the National Football League? Just a wild guess. Yes, sir. How about 10 million? Let's guess again. 14. How much was lost between fines and suspension? And I'll give you a hint. The fines, the number's not higher, and the number of the amount of fines in 14 went down from 13. Players lost 25 million dollars in 2014. And a lot of the money that's counted in this uh, topic, in that stat, is on uh, SpotRack, S-P-O-T-R-A-C, on uh, you know, SpotRack.com. It's like an internet site that has a lot of good contract and stat stuff. But $25 million. Now, that doesn't count all the money that was not lost to the newly found, dusted off from Mike McCann's textbook, the commissioner exempt list that you know existed in the NFL. But $25 million was forfeited, up from $10 million the year before. So people were indeed punished. Um, and that doesn't, like I said, Hardy and all these other guys that got paid, who knows what that number would have been if they had not got paid. We got a lot more to talk uh, about in this subject. We had a couple questions from the audience I want to get um, to them. If you wouldn't mind coming up to the mic so everybody can hear you. Yeah. Right over here. Thank you. My name is Bill Wilson. First off, um, I think Don Van Nata did a... Uh, an investigative piece which showed that uh, out of something like 802 cases in New Jersey, uh, Ray Rice was, was the only one who got that diversionary uh, uh, handling. Um, so it was clearly unique. I th it, the reason I spoke up about it was I think that it's fairly significant in terms of the overall theme that you see through all of these cases, which is, uh, uh, as I view it, the uh, preservation or the penetration of the glamour factory, okay? And I would argue that the glamour factory is something that's operated for, in every league, forever. And what we've seen, the reason it's so interesting is we are seeing those two things clash, the preservation versus the uh, uh, penetration, or in some, in some sense, the crumbling of the, ga the, uh, the glamour factory itself. And I think what we're seeing these days, particularly with domestic violence, is the crumbling of that factory. And the reason it's happening is uh, it's, uh, it's sort of like when Lewis Hine came here 100 years ago and found child labor and took photographs. We now have much better evidence, which is helping to crumble the factory. But with respect to what happened with Ray Rice, um, based on what I've read, I think it's just a, a, uh, a repeated pattern of the NFL going in very quickly when there's any hint of any problem and using their connections, which is what Van Nata suggested in New Jersey, to set up a very quick, simple, and fast disposition to bury the problem, which has been what their glamour factory has done for a long time. 
I couldn't disagree more. And I think it, <laughs> I was just going to say I, this I is a perfect a, question a for myth. you. <laughs> it's a myth that the public has that and, and, I mean there are lots of benefits to being a professional athlete. They make lots of money. They get they get lots of benefits, but it's a myth that they get treated with kid gloves and they get this preferential treatment. More often than not, they, the, the prosecutors, the police, the judges, and the media love to bring down these people from on high. And the public loves, loves to bring down these people from on high. And the, the, the focus that is on them, the spotlight that is on them uh, is just, it's troubling to them. You know, I, I've, I've, I know a lot of these players, and believe me, most of them just want to be normal people. They want to be treated just as, as regular people, and they don't, and they aren't. And it's, it's a very uncomfortable situation for them. Sir. Yeah, uh, Matt Cairns. The question I have is a slippery slope piece. If they're able to ban guys like Ray Rice or Greg Hardy, a buddy of mine sat next to him on the plane last week. He said he's a great guy, very nice, a lot of tattoos, and his wife was enamored with him the whole time. But the slippery slope, if you're going to ban Hardy and you're going to ban Ray Lewis, or Ray Rice, excuse me, can they stop Jameis Winston from even getting through the clubhouse door? It's sort of a Maurice Claret maybe problem there. Where does the line stop? Where can the NFL govern conduct? Is it before you? Before you get in, can they prevent you from joining the club or let you join the club and then shut you down then? Because a lot of college athletes are getting pinched right now for the domestic violence. Alan, you, you're up again. <laughs> you know, by, you know and, and the other myth is that, is that and, and you, you know, I think that racism was a, a very uh, big moment with respect to the Ray Rice situation as well as Adrian Peterson. And, you, and you, you saw a lot of white commentators, particularly white uh, female commentators, try to paint the NFL as if it were a league of thugs, which was the phrase they kept using, as if, as if domestic violence was rampant in the NFL, when actually the statistics show just the opposite, that the, the, the amount of individuals in the NFL who had been accused of domestic violence was less than of the population as a whole. And uh, you know, so to talk, you know, to talk about banning these players because they're bad people, they're thugs. Uh, it, typically, the people who are being talked about are African American, and I just think that uh, uh, I'm certainly uncomfortable with that kind of conversation. Let's, before we move on to, to Adrian Peterson, let's talk about. Rice in, you know, in, in the role that the NFL played. Um, you know, it, it almost we talk about leagues making things up as they go. Um, this was the ultimate case. Um, and when when this case, when the NFLPA took this before an arbitrator, um, the arbitrator ruled that the NFL was arbitrary in how um, you know they dealt with this case. Um, so, Mike, um, was what, what sort of mistakes did the NFL make, and particularly Goodell? And um, are the Ravens at all accountable? So I think in terms of Roger Goodell, I think the big mistake was taking a policy that wasn't in place when the conduct occurred and applying it to it. To me, it was a classic retroactive application of a rule that w was almost a layup for former Judge Jones, who was the arbitrator in this case, to say, you can't take a rule and apply it backwards in time. And she also found the NFL to lack any real explanation for doing so. You, you mentioned the word arbitrary. I thought that word just jumped out at me in her opinion, where she was saying the, the commissioner, at least, in the, at least with respect to Ray Rice, had behaved in an arbitrary way in looking at prior punishments where players would receive up to two games. And then he gets an indefinite suspension, which is itself curious. Why not pick a number instead of an indefinite period? I think that gave him even greater reason to argue that it was arbitrary because there was no specificity to it and it wasn't consistent with the prior ruling. So I think, to, I mean, like, at some level, I understood what the NFL was doing, right? The first penalty was two games and that led to outcry, right? It just seemed, given what he did, it seemed very low. It seemed to not meet what our expectations would be for the underlying offense that we saw video of. But I think, in a way, he turned Ray Rice into a victim 
by trying to change the rules in midstream, and then Roger Goodell looks like he's made a mistake when the underlying you know, bad person in the room is the one who hit his fiance and who dragged her. I think it took a lot to make Ray Rice seem sympathetic, but the NFL actually did that. Yeah. But, Warren, what about Goodell? Well, I, I was gonna say, um, commissioners have been overstepping their bounds for decades and trying to come down hard on players and then being rebuked by the court system or by an arbitrator. I mean, one of the most famous cases, a little bit before your time, perhaps, was Latrell Sprewell, right? Latrell Sprewell, in practice, chokes his coach. Could you imagine if there was social media then? And, by the way, <laughs> leaves, takes a shower, comes back, and attacks PJ again. David Stern decides, okay, inappropriate, I'm gonna terminate your contract and suspend you. And because it, had, it was so much greater in terms of the punishment than anything that had ever been meted out before, the arbitrator of the court say, no, that, that's just too much, which leads to the greatest law review title, law review article title in history, which is, in only the NBA can you coach your employer and get away with it. Choke. Choke, yeah, choke. choke your employer. Sorry, <laughs> choke your employer and get away with it. Sorry, I killed the punchline. So, <laughs> I mean, commissioners have forever been meeting out justice and arbitrators have been saying, you've gone too far, because they've attempted to say, this is conduct on becoming our league. And so I think part of the problem is that they haven't been forceful enough over time, and so now they're, they're coming back. And, and I mean, we don't have enough time on the panel, I sort of joked, to talk about Goodell's mistakes in his PR moves in how to handle Rice, Peterson, the Flategate, all of these things, it seems like he's reacting as opposed to thinking and strategically thinking, here's what we need to do. And by the way, we haven't mentioned the union in any of these things yet and the role that they play, which is unique in professional sports with collective bargaining and the rights and the CBA and all that sort of stuff. Let's, let, let's quickly you know, move on to Adrian Peterson. Um, and he's been in the news, um, you know, just being reinstated um, to, to the league. Um, so a Adrian Peterson back in, uh, you know, ba back in, uh, in the fall, um, it was he was indicted um, by a Texas grand jury for a reckless uh, or negligent injury to a child um, for hitting his son with a switch um, and causing significant damage. Uh, his son is four years old. Um, a switch being a small tree branch. Um, the, uh, the commission put him uh, on the exempt list uh, and he was he was paid, but he was barred from playing. Um, and then he pleaded no contest in November to reckless assault. Uh, following that plea deal, the NFL suspended Peterson without pay until at least April 15th of this year. Um, Peterson appealed the suspension. Uh, an arbitrator, an ex-NFL executive, uh, sustained it. Then Peterson again, through the NFL PA, petitioned uh, Judge Doty to vacate that award. Uh, the judge did so. Uh, in reason that the NFL retroactively punished Peterson um, and that his wrongdoing, his wrongful conduct, uh, conduct occurred before the NFL adopted its domestic violence policy in August as a result of the Ray Rice case. The NFL has appealed that to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. Um, so uh, going into the criminal realm, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you, Kimberly, uh, Kimberly was, um, was Peterson's uh, corporal punishment um, de considered domestic violence, and, and, and how do you view how that was gone through the court? Um, in, under New Hampshire law, it was, uh, falls within the scope of domestic violence. Um, and I think certainly, um, based on my understanding of the incident that gave, uh, incident that gave rise to the, to the charges, that it was um, absolutely an act of um, domestic violence. What, I mean, this is a little off of the, um, topic of your question, but one thing that struck me as interesting about the um, way his case was resolved in a court was that it was a no contest plea, which is not something that judges um, in the state of New Hampshire tend to look favorably on and often won't accept, um, particularly if it's a case that involves um, a violent act. Um, most of the time in the state of New Hampshire, um, judges will only accept a no contest plea if there's a, um, most typically it arises in motor vehicle cases where there may be some civil liability on the other end of things, or um, they might do it when someone is um, intoxicated to a level that affects their 
um, ability to recall exactly what happened, but upon um, reading, discovering, and understanding what the state's evidence is, they essentially say, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that's how it happened. Um, so it sort of struck me as, as an interesting um, uh, resolution from that perspective that he, that he had pled no contests um, um, in the matter. And I think, you know, similar to um, what happened with um, with Ray Rice, I think there was also, um, if I recall correctly, the charges were actually reduced to misdemeanor charges, and I think he also um, got probation and community service and, and um, a fine as well, which I think was, um, again, I, I think- Preferential? A, you know, preferential or, or, or and or, um, taking into consideration the consequences that, that were imposed by the league. But I think certainly it's something that, I mean, the, the acceptance of a, a, you know, and again, I, I'm not familiar with the um, court in which he pled, obviously, but, you know, taking into account it wasn't a, a no contest plea as opposed to a guilty plea. Um, and then also the reduction in the charges and, and everything, I think there's certainly um, an indication that uh, there was perhaps preferential treatment or, um, you know, and or, um, like I said, um, with respect to Ray Rice, consideration of what was also happening in the league, um, it, you know, for the court to fashion the, um, the resolution that it did or to accept the resolution that it did. Alan, you brought up race before. Um, you know, this, I think race plays a role in this. What role did it play? I mean, a lot of people say, you know, where, whereas Peterson's, uh, what he did with his son was excessive, many people say that's cultural. Yes, and I mean, he showed great contrition afterwards. I don't think he, uh, I, you know, I, I, everybody who knows Adrian Peterson says he's a good guy. This was certainly uh, a terrible thing that he did, uh, but I don't think he got preferential treatment by this. It was a Dallas judge, right? Yep. yep. Of course, Adrian Peterson is going to next year play for the Dallas Cowboys. So uh, how things work out. Um, Do you know something we don't know? Can we break it on Twitter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait and see. Just wait and see. So, um, Mike, start writing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to skip dinner later. <laughs> uh, BJ, uh, if anything, Adrian Peterson received decidedly unpreferential uh, treatment. Uh, preferential in the negative. Yeah, I, I think he was targeted. The, uh, he was indicted by a grand jury after only after the first grand jury refused to indict him and uh, he was faced his legal team was faced by a hyper aggressive um, county prosecutor who tried to uh, disqualify the judge based upon bias this was scorched earth by a by a politically motivated prosecutor who wanted a trophy and ultimately at the end of the day uh, the, D, the DA's office was forced to um, reduce this to a plea bargain because um, in a trial, are you going to take your chances against Rusty Hardin, who's never lost a case, and damage your reputation as a prosecutor and somebody who might have political uh, ambition? And who is going to testify against Adrian Peterson? Not the child, not the wife. The doctor wasn't going to be flying in from Minneapolis. This was a very difficult case for the uh, prosecutor to win, and quite honestly, it's a case that probably shouldn't have been brought after the first grand jury refused to indict, and it was only as a result of, it was only after the Ray Rice elevator video became right. part of the public conversation that this became a big deal to the NFL a year earlier. Uh, nobody would have batted an eye. He wouldn't have missed even so much as one game. And not, and I'm not excusing the conduct. I'm just discussing the context in which the prosecution and the subsequent discipline occurred. Robert, this is a much different case than Ray Rice in terms of, you know, Adrian Peterson is the best back in the league when healthy. Um, but given all that, how much money did he lose? Approximately. Uh, uh, it's a little confusing to me because, as, as we know, we talked about when he's on commissioner exempt, he's still getting paid. And, and I'm not sure we, we know the answer even if I had the number, I wouldn't know the right answer because he may go back and, if he can legally go back and do what Rice did and file back against the league or the team for some of those. Lawyers. Um, I think he was making something crazy like, I want to say $700,000 every, every in-season week, which is, again, almost as much as Michael makes for teaching now that he has tenure. Um, but is that true, Dean? I wish that was true. Yeah. <laughs> I want to. Well, you can make that true. No. <laughs> I, I, I want to quickly turn before we move off, and I want to turn to 
uh, I, I want to turn to Mike and I want to turn to Warren um, about you know what's been going on in in arbitration with Judge Doty right now. It keeps going back and forth. Where are we and um, what role? You know, we we haven't talked much about the NFLPA, but I'll start with you, Warren. You know, what yes, role has the NFLPA played in this, and have they done right or wrong by Adrian Peterson? I, I'd like to hear Mike first. You want me to go <laughs> first? On that? Yeah, All right, no, home no, court edge. You've been, co you've been covering a lot closer than I have. Has well, I think the Players Association has a duty to its players, and I think it has an obligation to fight for all of its members, no matter what they do. And I know this is something that with Alex Rodriguez has come up, yeah, that's right? A good point. Th this notion that how could you defend someone who we don't like? Well, that's not the point. The point is he's a member of, an, of a union, and there's a union obligation to fight. And I think the other issue that the NFLPA has to bear in mind, and I think it has, is the issue of precedent. That Roger Goodell has created a new system of rules on the fly and applying them in ways that aren't consistent. And I think, to me, that gives the Players Association a great motivation to challenge him at every step. And I think it's appropriate to file lawsuits and to seek, to seek injunctions against the NFL. Uh, even if a lot of people think, well, how could you defend this guy? Look at what he did. Uh, to me, that's totally irrelevant. It's really about preventing a precedent that we know the commissioner will use. And the NFLPA has, has been very successful, in, at least in this respect. The NFL lost on Ray Rice. The NFL lost so far on Adrian Peterson. Uh, this is, and I think the NFL could lose on Greg Hardy if they suspend him. Yeah. And I think in terms of Judge Doty, his decision to me uh, made sense. And now it's hard to have an arbitration award vacated. It seldom happens. There are very few conditions in which that can arise. And I'll give Dan Wallach credit. Well, most, in fact, I don't know any other legal who is saying Judge Doty is gonna reverse or vacate uh, Harold Henderson's arbitration award, you did, you got it right. And I think now the question is going to be what's going to happen before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit? Uh, I, to me, I feel like Judge Doty's opinion reads correctly. I think this was a retroactive application of a rule, and I think that's in itself arbitrary, and I think it was the appropriate decision. Dan, since, before we turn to Warren, Dan, since you are the supreme predictor, what is going to happen? Uh, I believe it's going to be upheld by the Eighth Circuit on appeal, but there's a very interesting dynamic going on here. Uh, the Eighth Circuit is one of the most conservative federal appellate courts in the country, and uh, victories at the district court level oftentimes are snatched away on appeal, and no greater example of that than Brady versus NFL uh, during the 2011 uh, yep. Lockout, the uh, NFL Players Association won, not before Judge Doty, but won before Judge Susan Richard Nelson, and the Eighth Circuit clutched it away. But I believe th the NFL Players Association is on much stronger legal ground here, and so is Judge Doty, because what the NFL is, ha has, uh, what, what the NFL has done here is enacted what I believe and what we all hear in constitutional law as the classic ex post facto law. They, uh, they came up with a new policy, enacted a new policy, and applied it to conduct which took place before the enactment of the policy. Well, our United States Constitution expressly prohibits bills of attainder and ex post facto provisions, and an ex post facto law, besides being unconstitutional, goes to the very heart of fundamental fairness, and no court should countenance uh, a, retroactive, a retroactive application of a criminal law to, to, to conduct which took place before its enactment. So on the law, if, if, we're not, if we're talking about, if we're removing political considerations and ideology from the process, Adrian Peterson and the NFL Players Association uh, should expect success at the Eighth Circuit. But one never knows with the most conservative federal appellate court in the country. And the next battleground will, will be whether the, NF, whether the Eighth Circuit uh, decides to stay the effect of Judge Doty's order because the next battleground will be, can Adrian Peterson be reinstated by Goodell? And, Ju and Judge Doty's order remands uh, the matter back to Harold Henderson, who in turn will probably kick it back to Goodell to discipline Adrian Peterson under the then applicable personal conduct policy, which would have maxed out at a two-game suspension. So I believe in the NFL's best interest, they want to remove Roger Goodell from having to make any decisions any more in the Adrian Peterson case and the vehicle uh, that will get them there will be asking the Eighth Circuit 
uh, asking Judge Doty first, and then ultimately the Eighth Circuit to stay the effect of Judge Doty's order. And the NFLPA has stood solidly behind Adrian Peterson. I'd be very happy if my union assigned Jeffrey Kessler to represent me in federal court. So they've been they've been doing a great job, and they've stood side by side with them. In fact, they're the petitioning party in the federal court lawsuit. The case is brought in the name of the NFL Players Association on behalf of Adrian Peterson. I, I, and I think I agree that the Players Association has definitely stepped up, stepped up. But I do think we can perhaps assign some blame to the Players Association because they punted on this issue of personal conduct policy in the last collective yeah. bargaining agreement where they focused on economic issues. Mm -hmm. They let the clock run out. They didn't fight to create restrictions on the commissioner's authority. This allowed the commissioner in August to write a memo to owners saying there's a new domestic violence policy. Well, why wasn't that collectively bargained? And why was it communicated through a memo to owners as opposed to having a discussion with players? I think a lot of this has to do with the Players Association's priorities are so fixated on economic issues, current players, forget retired players, but current players, that they then create this world where they're playing catch up, where they're having to hire Jeffrey Kessler and other lawyers to try to combat the commissioner. I think being more proactive and looking at, and I think when the next CBA comes up, I hope they devote some resources to that rather than doing this fight after the fact approach. Yeah, you know, Mike, the basketball players and football players have been very poorly served by the executive directors of their respective players association. I mean, going from Gene Upshaw to DeMaurice Smith, I hope this isn't being recorded. Uh, I is. mean, it's been a major step down in the quality of representation. And then uh, let's not even begin to talk about the NBA situation. Uh, that's been well chronicled, and we're, fit, we're looking at a time in which player rights in both these leagues have been significantly eroded, and it's occurring against the backdrop of very weak representation and very weak leadership at the Players Association level. Uh, there's no Donald Fear in the basketball or the football Players Association offices, and they're getting, they're getting creamed at the bargaining table, and of course, the bottom line will always be in any negotiation between billionaires and millionaires, especially when the millionaires have a very short shelf life in which to ply their trade. The billionaires will always win at the bargaining table if the courts are not willing to intervene. Warren, do you want the last word on this? Um, I, we've sort of gone around ad nauseum for this point. I, I think the interesting point as a sports lawyer is, I go back with Mike's point in the NFLPA fumbling, as you see with unions, as, as Dan pointed out appropriately, that during the collective bargaining, you're talking about growing the pie and you're talking about splitting up the pie with revenue but they spend little time talking about some of these issues that have come home to roost. I do find, I, I find the P Peterson case actually less interesting than the A-Rod situation with the role of the union and the fact that you've got a union whose members don't want them to protect Alex Rodriguez. I mean, the members are in favor, by and large, for the drug testing and abhor A-Rod. And there was a lot of radio silence on behalf of the Major League Baseball Players Association during that for a long time. So I found that really fascinating. The PA is sticking up for, for Peterson, hiring uh, Kessler, and, and you know, I, I think that that's going to, as Dan's predicted, I think that's where we're going we're gonna to go. I agree with that. I just had one final point on, on A-Rod. Does anybody know how much he made in, in 2014? $25 million. No, no. no. After, after his suspension. He made $3 million on a deferred signing bonus. We'll leave that alone. You know how much he got paid in salary last year during the season? He was only suspended, and this may have been illegal or some sort of numbers machination. He was suspended for the regular season, which was 162 out of the 183 days. So he received 21 183 of his salary. So he made $3 million or so in deferred bonus, and he also made another $3.5 million. I had as many swings at the plate as he did. And he still made six and a half million dollars. He also made a lot more from Nike than you did, I bet. Uh, probably. For sure. All right, let's finish on a, a little bit of a lighter note and, and quickly talk about Deflategate. And I understand we're in uh, enemy territory here. Well, not for me, but um, <laughs> we're, in, we're in New England. And uh, obviously, the Patriots just won the Super Bowl. Um, and But prior to that, after the AFC championship game, there was this whole Deflategate controversy, which uh, took off in the media. Um, and uh, so, you know, I want to try to explore, you know, why has this become such, why did it become such a national story so quickly? Um, 
and what role did the league, uh, other teams play into it? Um, and then finally, you know, if it turns, to, you know, if it turns out to be some fabrication, um, do the Patriots have grounds to sue the NFL? Well, at first, I, I prefer the phrase "bulgazi." <laughs> Is there and, a reason why? And and like like Benghazi, I think this was a <laughs> this was a, a, a much ado about nothing. I, I'm a Patriots fan. I think I, I agree. I mean, it, it there is so little in terms of. I understand this. You know, let's let's concern ourselves with the integrity of the game. But if you talk to anybody about the impact that this might have had during a game. Zero. So I, I think if, if it had not been the Patriots, if it had been the Cleveland Browns or if it had been, you know, the Houston Texans doing the same sort of thing, it would be, it wouldn't be anywhere near headlines, right? It would be mentioned as a passing and away we go, right? I think what the Falcons did was far more egregious in terms of intentionally, pumping you know, crowd. pumping music in that actually could have some bearing on the outcome of a game. And that was brushed aside in a matter of hours. So, I mean, the only, the only thing that I think that the NFL has done in all of these incidents in the past two years is they finally challenged Mark Emmert for incompetency in running an organization at the NCAA because they've continued to make mistakes and blunders in a, in a, in a level that, you know, here we are at a, at a sports law panel talking about Something that I, I think has zero bearing on the outcome of a game. But I'm biased. I'm a Patriots fan. I am too. But let, let's explore, you know, given, you know, that a, a lot of people agree it's much ado about nothing, but it was a huge story. I mean, do the Patriots yep. have grounds to sue? I don't think so. And, I, and as much as I think this scandal was really absurd, as, I think as Alan noted, that there was, there was nothing to it, uh, I think it would be difficult for the Patriots to really bring a claim against the NFL. Uh, for one, it seems as if the harm came through leaks from somewhere, right? There were clearly a number of leaks that were made. I think they're from the league office, but it's hard to know that for sure. The leaks were inconsistent, right? Some of the leaks speculated that the that 12 balls had been deflated. Uh, there were conflicts about whether or not the, the degree to which they were underinflated. So it looks as if the story wasn't straight. And, and that just, to me, suggests that that maybe the leaks weren't coming entirely from the league office. But in any event, I think the problem for the Patriots, if they wanted to bring a legal claim against the NFL, is that the league constitution makes clear that owners give up certain rights. And the, commission, the league constitution has language saying that this is non-appealable, whatever the commissioner decides on matters of fair play. And the franchise agreement between teams and the NFL includes a waiver of recourse clause. And the waiver recourse clause would likely cover a claim over this. The, the clause would say, in so many words, by virtue of buying a team, you give up the capacity to sue the league itself and other owners. So I think this has been a disaster for the NFL, but I don't think it will lead to litigation. Uh, Warren mentioned that if it was anything but the Patriots, uh, he, thought, he thinks it was, would be you know, a non-story. How much do you think... Uh, for anyone on the panel, Spygate has contributed to this. The fact that Spygate was a hundred times worse, and it could have uh, impacted the game, or at least given the Patriots a competitive advantage. It's almost like a repeat offender. Um, you know, how much did, did that impact? I think, uh, on, coming from a non-Patriot fan, an enormous effect. I think this is a case where the Patriots' reputation preceded itself, and the fact that people immediately went onto social media and pulled up pictures of. Bob Kraft and uh, Goodell the night before, you know, the alleged <laughs> incident together, and, you know, they were all buddy-buddy counting their money together, and then all of a sudden, you know, this comes up and everybody wants to go after the Patriots because their reputation was bad. I think Warren's point is dead on. If it was another team, that wouldn't have happened. And hopefully, you know, at the end of the day, now we this weekend we have free agency, so we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about the draft and who's going to be good and all these legal cases still going on, and this will go. And I think what's going to happen is Goodell's going to have to, you know, give a public apology to his buddy, and maybe they can be buddies again. Because um, Kraft, you know, supposedly, was one of his staunchest supporters. And when, when things got a little ugly for support for Goodell, he was always there. So I think your point, Warren, is dead on on that. 
Okay, let's, um, and, you know, we have a few minutes left for questions, so I'd like to open it up. Um, yes, Dean. <laughs> we have a response. And the reason that we couldn't, re I couldn't answer that question is because I don't have anything remotely approximating the power that the commissioner has. I have no discretion at all. I'm totally powerless in the face of my, uh, my tenured faculty. Um, so it seems to me that at the root of so much of what's been discussed tonight is discretion, unbounded discretion that's being exercised badly um, by the commissioner, by various other players in the net, or in, you know, folks in the net. So. And Mike, you touched on this in terms of the collective bargaining agreement having failed to address, I would assume, with more specificity, frankly, too much discretion with regard to the working time departments. Is the answer to this more systemically? what is and is not punishable, punishable and how, or is discretion really an important part of managing an operation like this? And the problem is really, at the end of the day, you just have the wrong people at the end. I, th I think, I think it may be the latter, that there are the wrong people that are exercising the discretion. The NBA commissioner has pretty similar discretion, not to the same extent, if a player is suspended for more than 12 games, there's a right to have an independent appeal. but. It seems as if Adam Silver in using the discretion, notwithstanding some of the critiques in, in favor of, or I guess supporting Donald Sterling in, with respect to that he could keep his team, but I think Adam Silver, in fact that Adam Silver is a lawyer, I think plays a role. Roger Goodell is not a lawyer. I, to me, I think it's meaningful that if you look at the commissioners of the other leagues, they're all attorneys. And we haven't seen the same type of controversy in those leagues in terms of how the commissioner is using the discretion so I don't know if it's, if it's as much the rules are wrong as it is those who are applying the rules don't understand something like not being arbitrary, or don't understand that you can't retroactively apply rules. I think part of it, maybe a big part of it, is who is the decider as opposed to the rules that he or she is using. But there's also a difference, though, in terms of applying rules and discretion amongst the owners versus the players, right? I mean, so everyone talks about the commissioner and, and you know, the integrity of the game and all that sort of stuff, but the commissioner is an employee of the owners, period. And that, that commissioner does not represent the players. That's the union's job. And while they oversee the rules of the game and, and everything else, when they apply some level of discretion upon the players, you've got a union to say, well, wait a minute, let's figure out whether that's just. They've got far more discretion on internal owners and, and everything else. So there, there's a difference there, I think. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, we're talking about how the NBA and the NFL have this expanding, rapidly growing tie-in with the league and the CBA and the, the league is ready to provide as much as possible. Why baseball is the slowest growing or even shrinking tie, and they tend to have the strongest unions. Is it the length of the career? Is it the length of the season? Marvin Miller. I think it's been that way for a long, long time. Well, I think baseball, too, has been stronger than it's ever been. It's a $30 billion a year business. And, and it, it's, it's growing. You know, it's, uh, you know, they have a problem in inner cities. Um, but, you know, you look at the, the TV contracts, um, the revenue sharing, uh, you know, you look at uh, the luxury tax, um, you know, the, the equita ba equitable balance, uh, the expanded playoffs. Uh, I think you could argue baseball is stronger than ever. But it come, I mean, you've got Marvin Miller who starts the union and makes it the first really strong labor union, right? I mean, it's Major League Baseball Players Association, maybe UAW, were, were the big ones. And by the way, baseball has this labor exemption. I mean, they've got this antitrust exemption. Now, I, they, they came through the trilogy of cases from federal baseball to Toulson to Kurt Flood. And I know that we've got the Kurt Flood Act, but taking away that ammunition to challenge some of the um, league's decisions, that also has played a role in, in, in their stability. But it's a strong league. Uh, other questions, yes.
Next question. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, honestly, to me, that is something that's probably more egregious and more likely to be happening than, uh, hopefully, than some of the racist comments that are coming out. I mean, I think that's what's probably most frightening about the owner's power in these leagues. <laughs> you don't like the fact that he was on this party bus? I mean, if you think about it, right? I mean, it's that, that quid pro quo type idea or the appearance of. I mean, that's kind of the big campaign finance issue is can you, will people be corrupt just by being associated with these people or getting money or being, you know, perked by them? So I just, to me, you know, when you have a, a key person in, in the officiating group associated so closely with one team, uh, that kind of gives off this, this appearance of corruption. Well, I'm more offended by his relationship with uh, Governor Christie. Well, yeah. yeah. There's, there's a well, yeah. well, it is very troubling. It is very troubling when you have a tight relationship between the commissioner and, you know, one of the team owners. I mean, no greater case than in the Baltimore Ravens' Ray Rice uh, situation, and one could argue that uh, Goodell's uh, friendship with Steve uh, Biscotti, is that the, na the, the name of the owner, had, a, had an effect on uh, Roger Goodell going soft on Ray Rice the first time around. And the relationships between owners, individual owners, and the commissioner play a large role. I mean, some owners are in the doghouse, other owners are, you know, in the penthouse partying in the, in the, in the suite right next to the commissioner. So one could argue that uh, relationships do matter, and it is troubling because it affects, uh, it affects the ultimate punishment when uh, commissioners are playing favorites among the owners. Uh, we have time for a couple more. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, yes, ma'am. So the, the evidentiary standards is through the Constitution where there is a, there's a requirement that there's full cooperation between teams and the league in any league investigations. And this would fall under the purview of a league investigation because Ted Wells has been appointed by the commissioner. So you know, what that means specifically is hard to know. It seems as if the Patriots have been forthcoming as far as I can tell in providing information. Uh, I know that the league is trying to, or at least Ted Wells is trying to replicate the studies that the Patriots propose. But to me, on the evidence issue, if it turns out to be true, and I know there have been many leaks and rumors, so it's hard to know what's true and what isn't, but if it's true that at least one of the balls may have been sold off uh, by an NFL official, uh, that to me raises the issue of spoilation of evidence. I mean, I, I think if the league is the investigator and the judge, and some of the officials, I think one individual allegedly has been fired, right? right? Yes. I, mean, yep. I don't understand how you can eat. I, to me, that the case should be dropped. Yes. To me, I, I, I actually think the NFL should have already dropped this investigation, issued an apology, and moved on. And instead, right. I think by dragging it out, what, what is this report going to say? I, I, my gut is that it says something as if there may have been an offense, but we have no evidence to know who's at fault, and therefore there's no punishment. I see. I mean, yeah, maybe the Colts. They were. were. <laughs> they were. Um, all right, one more. One more question. Yes, sir. Right here. Uh, it talks a lot about public perception of crime. And is it possible just to problem even more with people that are commentating and presenting their opinions as specific facts, just keeping with the play gate and spy gate? Many of the, the actual facts behind spy gate aren't actually reported. It's just people giving their opinion that they did cheat without reporting many of the facts behind it. Is there anywhere that you Well, <laughs> you know, some of the networks have been faced with a code of conduct of their own. Uh, recently, I believe CBS and TNT had a, general, a, broadcast, a basketball broadcaster that had an off the field. Uh, ESPN has had more than one uh, situation where they literally had to suspend a, a, a guy because of a Twitter, something controversial on Twitter. So I, I don't know from a league point of view, you know, legal point of view, but I think that it's an excellent question. There are a lot of issues that come up, and um, just because somebody's a deemed expert, obviously excluding McCann, um, doesn't mean that they're very qualified. 
Well, I'll, I'll take that as as a journalist. I think you know uh, I'm a hardcore journalist as as they come, and so everybody with one of these has become a journalist, or they think yes. they are. And um, even seasoned journalists, you know, with the with with Twitter, it's it's become this great resource for information, but it's also become very dangerous, and people are re re reckless. I teach journalism classes all the time. And um, you know, I tell I, I tell my students, and I would tell anybody here, it's better to be uh, second and right than first and wrong, because if you think of all the things, you know, who you know, aside from LeBron, which Sports Illustrated broke, um, who who remembers, you know, who broke, you know, a regular transactional story or this, that, and the other? They don't. But you know, the person that screwed up, you're going to remember, you know, who that person was. DJ, do you think do you think networks actually keep a stat as to who broke stories, who was first to the, to the not networks, but but you know I'll tell you what you know you look at BuzzFeed and you look at Gawker, you look at uh, Huffington Post and whatever, they just don't keep track. They put it up on a video screen on the wall. How many hits? You know how many social referrals? It's in real time. There's tremendous pressure to write things. How many remember uh, you know last week? You know the dress was it blue and black or yellow and or, or white and gold? Exactly. You know how many you know how many page views BuzzFeed got off that stupid thing? Thirty five million. Thirty five million page views by throwing that question and two pictures out there. And that's that's kind of where we are right now. And you know, we uh, you know we, we can you know, you guys are an educated group. Um, you know, I'm I'm a journalist that, you know, is is very staunch in, in my ethics and way of doing things. Um, but most people want crap, and most people want it quickly. So, um, you know, TV is the biggest culprit because it's shooting from the hip. Stephen A. Smith, you could suspend him every day. Um, <laughs> but, and he's been suspended a lot. I mean, you look at, you know, look at Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons is a Boston guy. I grew up, you know, covering high school games when, you know, Simmons was at the Herald and I was at the Globe. And uh, I knew Simmons way back. But you know why did he get suspended last time um, for you know not for saying what he said against Goodell um, without any facts? He threatened his bosses. Um, so you know our, our culture is you know now especially in the media, who he who shouts the loudest wins, and and that's unfortunate. Um, so um, I. Until the general public doesn't accept that and keeps clicking on it and lauding these people, um, it's not going to change. But what can we all do as as consumers? Um, you know, we can choose what we read and what we believe. Um, and so that we're we're in a quandary here. You know, as as the mainstream media, you know, we're trying to do things right, but we're competing against TMZ. You know, which you know pays one hundred fifty thousand dollars for a Ray Rice video. I'm never going to pay for a story ever. I don't care if somebody says, you know, I have, you know, I have evidence that A. Rod started juicing when he was in high school, you know, and I can give it to you right now, but it's going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars. See you later. Um, but so people will pay for that. So just like people will try to stir the pot to either put false information or rumors out on Twitter or social media, and that, you know, it, and it runs, you know. Through the gamut, when Joe Paterno was dying, um, CBS ended up running with something that a student newspaper reporter at Penn State tweeted, but they didn't attribute it to them, and then it, it went off like wildfire. You know, if you look at, you know, almost it, it doesn't matter who breaks the news, um, whether it's credible or not, it's going to get out there. You know, who broke the biogenesis uh, scandal and the the Ryan Braun and A Rod? It's the Miami New Times. Which was which was a, uh, a free weekly newspaper that you get at the checkout line in supermarkets. Very good paper. You know, they, they're they've done excellent work, but it's not ESPN. You know, it's not the New York Times that does it. So it can come from anywhere. So, um, you know, I, I think the Duke it's Duke story, the student newspaper. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yes. So, yes. you know, I, I think we're you know it's, it's it's an exciting time in media just because there's so much going on, but it's dangerous because. People aren't trained. People, people just kind of put out stuff to to stir the pot. And you know, as you know, as you are learning as law students, a lot of that's defamatory. Um, a lot of that can get you in a lot of trouble. 
Um, so you have to be careful not only of what you put out there, whether it's your, on your own social profile, but be careful what you believe because most of it's not true. Um, well, thank you all. Um, you guys have uh, you guys have been a, a great audience, very engaged. Thank you to our esteemed panel. This is uh, you know we're very lucky to be joined by such uh, prominent experts and accomplished experts. Thank you to uh, Dean Budd and uh, the University of New Hampshire School of Law for hosting this. Um, we're going to have um, you know a light reception uh, with some refreshments out right out here on the rotunda. So please uh, join us if you can, and uh, you know thank you for. Uh, you know, your attention here, and these are all important issues that we're going to be discussing for the, the days and weeks to come. Thank you. Thank you.